Hello, I'm Hartwig Fischer, Director of the British Museum. Welcome to our series on objects of crisis. We look at certain objects from the collection of the British Museum to explore how people in the past have faced major crises, how they have prevailed and at times faltered in tackling those crises. And we have looked at objects uh, related to a personal health crisis, um, climate crisis, and uh, today we welcome Jill Cook, Keeper of the Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory at the British Museum. Jill, it's wonderful to see you. I'm very curious to, to learn which object you have chosen and which story it tells us. I work on the archaeology of human evolution. So I have a very broad view of, of how um, evolving populations of, of humans have faced many changes, some of them very rapidly caused by a, a volcano or an earthquake, others the consequence of gradual climate change, and have consistently adapted and, and found um, usually technological way, ways around or through migration, through ways to, to get over it and, and get on. So we've become one of the most adaptable and absolutely the most successful animal um, on Earth. So where does that bring us on, you know, when we look at the, the timeline? For fully modern people in Europe, we're, we're talking um, between 40 and 50,000 years ago until uh, around 10,000 years ago. For the north of Europe, including Britain, this is often a period when the landscape is not habitable. It's too cold, it's too treacherous, and, the, and, and generally too dry. Uh, we tend to think about the Ice Ages as white and snowy, uh, because so much of the sea is locked up as ice. There's little evaporation, so there's little rain and snowfall. So instead of imagining deep snow, you must imagine hard frozen ground, very little vegetation. And so animals tend to um, avoid that kind of territory, especially when it's melting and it's fly ridden and it's boggy and swampy and you get stuck. So for long periods within that pit time, they, People can't occupy this street. Because they, will have to, they feed on animals, so they follow the animals. They follow the animals. Yeah. But these must have been very small populations. Uh, uh, under yeah. these harsh circumstances, it was probably not easy to survive. No. Um, European populations drop to a point which is almost extinction in Europe. Yeah. So there's very few people left. And it's in terms of genetic viability, uh, it's touch or go whether we get through. And after that, as it starts to warm up, we see very different cultural expressions. So they get through this by the skin of their teeth. Uh, and then we have a very different types of stone artifacts start to show themselves, including one which uh, we've tended to think of as rather an art object, this wonderful Volgu point, which is uh, 30 centimetres uh, long uh, and so finely made that you can see through it. Uh, but what they represent is that change which then precedes a kind of renaissance in Ice Age art, the, the return of cave painting and a, a huge increase in uh, drawing and sculpting on bone, antler and ivory. So we also have evidence of symbolic activity in, in that last uh, phase of the last ice age. When, you know, crisis after crisis hits these groups, but mm. in, in terms of, of climate change. So the, the object that you have chosen, does that relate to that passage really, of populations 
starting to move north again and, it, and it relates to the recovery and it relates to people getting into britain and finding the rock shelters and caves in the gorge at Creswell Crags. And from the 19th century onward, archeological finds were found there, which give an extraordinary view of life right through the last ice age. There's Neanderthal remains there, as well as those, these later remains that we're talking about. And that so, object is, is, yeah. is a, a drawing on a piece of rib, and there's a lovely engraving of a galloping horse with his head stretched forward, his mane up, but in this galloping position. And yes. over the top of him, diagonal lines, uh, which have been interpreted either perhaps as spears or perhaps uh, posts of a palisade to run the horses into a dead end to their death. We don't know what the meaning of those lines are. But the drawing, the drawing is, or the engraving rather, is extraordinary in, in, in rendering, you know, so, in such a lively fashion, the traits of the animal, even the, the gaze, the eyes of, of the animal, you can, you can really see them very distinctly, as if the person who, who did the drawing must have known very intimately the ways of animals. Oh, absolutely. And uh, it, it, curiously enough, um, uh, Stubbs um, painted uh, the frightened horse, which is being attacked by a lion, actually in Creswell Crags. Yeah. So he knew the crags. He little knew what remains were underneath his feet. But the reason it is said that he was so marvellous at drawing um, or particularly horses, was that he dissected them so that he understood the musculature and the skeleton. And, of course, our Ice Age ancestors are eating them, so they're butchering them. They, they know how they're built. And so you're absolutely right. These, these drawings and figures are um, wonderfully uh, naturalistic at times. Sometimes they will abstract the animal to just give you the spirit of it rather than the, the actual physique. Um, and it's, this horse at Creswell is very like all of the, the wonderful finds we have in the collection from southwest France, except for one thing. And that is? They do this lovely drawing, and there's the signs that they, it's been handled and worn. And then, uniquely... They take a burin, which is uh, the engraver's tool, the stone tool, which they use to make the horse. And you can see across the top of the drawings, there are deep horizontal lines, vehemently, strongly engraved, deleting this image. And then after those lines have been made, it's been snapped and broken. Mm. When, when you say... When you subsume this object under the, the the category of crisis, the crisis you refer to is not this um, thousands of years of glaciation and of inhabitable lands which drove people further south and might have killed many. Um, you refer to that one moment where we... And, and we have the trace of an individual hand doing this, yeah. where its drawing is effaced and the bone is broken. So what, as, as a scholar, um, an expert who's seen so many of these images from so many regions of the world, from all continents, um, what do you make of this act? How do you interpret this act? It's a kind of iconoclasm. It's kind of a, 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 a breaking of the spirit, a, a, an act of, of desperation. So whatever it is, it's serious. It may be uh, a death. It may be a, sitting waiting for the horses to come and they don't turn up and you're really, really hungry and whatever this bone had helped you to... Um, 
symbolized in your mind seems to have failed. Mm. Uh, there is a sense of crisis about that damage and breaking. Um, and uh, sadly, all too recently, we've seen iconoclasm around the world, which is caused by uh, aggression and, and uh, all kinds of, of social failures. So we don't know exactly what, but this is so unusual to be leaked and break like this. Uh, something is wrong. Maybe the person who made the drawing has turned out to be a bad person. Um, we can't absolutely rule out crime or even a broken love affair deep, deep in this time. But uh, whatever it is, it's a moment of crisis which we can capture archaeologically. And that's a very rare thing through this period. How, how did this extraordinary object end up um, in, in the British Museum? Because this was such a rare thing to be found in Britain, by the 1870s, lots of these things were known from France and had come to the British Museum. But, you know, here was a unique find for Britain. So a committee was formed and the object was given to the British Museum. It was on display for a long time. It went up to uh, a new museum that the British Museum helped to uh, establish uh, in Creswell Crags uh, and has been on long-term loan for everybody locally and visiting in to this lovely spot from uh, miles around. And, and again, that element of crisis comes in. Uh, we participated in this work because it was important in helping to regenerate a, uh, uh, an area brought to its knees to crisis by the end of the mining industry. Yeah. So unemployment, poverty, all kinds of, 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 of difficulties ensued from that from the early 80s. Uh, we participated in the restoration of the gorge itself and uh, then building the, the new visitor centre and, and museum. So that's, uh, again, um, through COVID-19, had its crisis, like all heritage yeah. uh, uh, buildings. And they have uh, been granted emergency funding and are hoping to reopen shortly. So for all the staycationers, it'll be yeah. a great thing to, a great place for a walk and things to see. We can only invite um, our listeners to um, pay a visit to this beautiful museum and uh, to this extraordinary uh, spot, um, um, which is so important for our understanding of the deep history of the British Isles. And of course, the British Museum um, and, and the partnership you've just mentioned, uh, which, is, which is so important for, for all of us, is, is one among more than 150 active collaborations across the country between the British Museum and all these wonderful important museums. Thank you for listening. If you liked it, please subscribe. And if you can, please donate to www.britishmuseum.org slash donate. Thank you very much.